Well, we are back in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we started uh, in the book of Hebrews at the beginning of the year, and I said to you that this is going to be a year-long series. Uh, we're literally going to take our time and work through this incredible book uh, called Hebrews, and, uh, and there's a lot that has been said to us. Uh, God's been speaking. God continues to speak, and many of us, we've learned. We've learned. If you've been journeying with us, we've learned so much about who Jesus is and what he's done for us. In fact, I would say the theme of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is better, and we're going to see that again this morning in our text, and so if you have a Bible, uh, I'll ask that you meet me in Hebrews chapter 7, all right? Hebrews chapter seven is where we are going to be. We're going to be in all 28 verses, all right, all 28 verses. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray, um, and then I'm going to read the chapter to us, and then we're going to jump in, okay? So I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me, uh, asking that God would do a work that only he can do, and that is save many people. And so Uh, Eyes closed, heads bowed, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Uh, Thank you for your word, that we can come to it, uh, to to hear from you. Father, we want to see you for who you are, and so would you reveal yourself in this moment. Father God, open up our hearts, open up our minds, uh, so that we might uh, see and understand and uh, be drawn to you. All of us are in desperate need of a savior. His name is Jesus. And so would you come, Lord Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, lead in this moment. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 7. I believe it will be up on the screen as well if you do not have a Bible in front of you. Hear these words of our Father. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God Most High, met Abraham and blessed him as he returned from defeating the kings. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, that also, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever." Now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the plunder to him. The sons of Levi, who received the priestly office, have a command according to the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brothers and sisters, though they have also descended from Abraham. But one without this lineage collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, men who will die receive a tenth, but in the other case, Scripture testifies that he lives. And in a sense, Levi himself, who receives a tenth, has paid a tenth through Abraham, for he was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Confused? Okay, cool. Let's stay with me. Verse 11. Now, if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, For on the basis of it, the people received the law. What further need was there for another priest to appear, said to be according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to the order of Aaron? For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must be a change of law as well. For the the one these things are spoken about belonged to a different tribe. No one from it has served at the altar. Now it is evident that our Lord came from Judah, And Moses said nothing about the tribe concerning priests. And and this becomes clearer if another priest like Melchizedek appears, who did not become a priest based on legal regulation about physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. For it has been testified. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So the previous command is annulled because it was weak and unprofitable, for the law perfected nothing. But a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. None of this happened without an oath. For others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath made by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now, many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. 
But because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. For this is the kind of high priest we need. Holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do, first for their own sins, then for those of the people. He did this once for all time when he offered himself. For the law appointed as high priests men who are weak. But the promise of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been perfected forever. That's a mouthful. And I'm going, to be, I'm going to be honest, like when I read it the first few times, I, I, I was like, this feels like, uh, it feels like I'm reading a, uh, a King Arthur novel, right? Or maybe a C.S. Lewis book, right? right? The Chronicles of Narnia, right? Uh, Melchizedek, a man with no beginning and no end. I mean, it feels that way, right? Like, I'm, I'm like, what on earth is going on? He bringeth a tenth of his plunder. Like, wow, this is intense. But also, it feels like I'm reading the regulations that you must go through before you accept the purchase of an app. Like, have you guys, have you guys ever read those? Of course you haven't, right? You guys just scroll to the bottom. And, and then you're tempted to do that, right? Like, let's just scroll to the bottom, scroll to the... Accept. I just believe. I believe it's the word of God, but you've, you've read nothing, and it makes no sense to you. Like, I get it. And so my hope this morning is to try to unpack some of that. It's to try to make it plain to you. Because look, we, we, we must understand what's going on. Look, it's amazing. You can go to Genesis 14 and read the story about Melchizedek and Abraham. It's incredible. And I, you must. You must go read it. And also, yes, there's a lot of regulations and a lot of laws and things happening here. And yes, you must read it. But the important thing is that you must understand it. It is crucial that you understand it. And so that is my hope this morning. See, the summary of this chapter is basically the summary of the entire book of Hebrews. And I said it in the intro, but permit me to say it again, and that is that Jesus is better. He is better than anything and everything. You see, in chapter 7, the writer of Hebrews, he goes hard in chapter 7. The author of Hebrews goes really, really, really hard at the system of the tabernacle, the temple, and the high priest. He goes hard at the whole sacrificial system. And I feel like Aaron is going, again? Like, it wasn't, a, it wasn't just a couple chapters ago that you, already, you brought me up and you remind, yes, I know that Jesus is better, but, but it feels like the, the author of Hebrews goes, no, you guys need to be clear about this. The tabernacle, the temple, the high priest, the whole sacrificial system, like the thing that you love, that you've loved for years, that you've been obedient to for years, Jesus is better. But friends, is this, is this not the sales pitch for virtually every single product on market? Whether it's a, a new car, a faster computer, a better phone, a more promising career, or a more attractive companion? That it's better? See, this world wants you to believe that it can provide for you something better for your soul. But the author of Hebrews says, there is only one thing. There is only one thing that you must have. Only one thing that you must have, and that is Jesus Christ himself as your faithful and merciful high priest because there is nothing, there is nothing better for you than him. See, the world, our flesh, the devil, they will do everything possible to convince you otherwise. And the things of the world, the structures of the world, the systems of the world, the joys of this world, they're all, they'll just give us temporary relief. That's what they give us. Temporary relief and only fading pleasure, which will eventually steal, kill, and destroy. Because that's that's the plan of the devil. Jesus tells us he's only ever had one plan, and that is to steal, kill, and destroy. And he will use anything and everything to do that, to convince you that you don't need Jesus. 
When in reality, we all need to put our trust in Jesus as our faithful and merciful high priest. We need to put our faith in in the sacrifice, this once for all sacrifice of himself on our behalf. You see, the law of Moses required animal sacrifices to atone, to atone, atone, atone. This word atone means to make mends. This word atone means to remove the obstacle that stands in the way for us to get to God, to atone. So, So the law of Moses required animal sacrifices to atone for sin in Israel. And there were a lot of sacrifices. We'll get to them in Hebrews chapter 10, but it tells us that the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. And so year after year after year after year after year after year, they would make these sacrifices so that they might have a relationship with God. I mean, about 17% of the laws under the Mosaic system were connected to sacrifices and offerings, 17%. Now, I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but so let me break it down for you. That's 105 laws. 105 laws connected to sacrifices and offerings. And of those, there were about five main types of sacrifices in the Old Testament. The burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, and then various types of peace offerings. Can you imagine having to like remember those, like like you do something and you're like, okay, which one is connected to the sin that I've just committed? What am I supposed to do? Because if you don't, you are in big trouble. See, God is saying to you and me in this passage, that even with all of that, there is only one thing that is better for our souls. And that is Jesus Christ as our great high priest. Do, do, Do you need cleansing of your soul from the guilt and shame of a rebellious life that was devoted to sinful self gratification? Do do you need a sacrifice to be offered for you to to be reconciled so that you might have a relationship with God? Do you need a hope for the future that will never disappoint? Oh, come on, someone. The sort of hope that will fuel you in this present moment and sustain you in the difficult days that lie ahead. And hear me, they are coming. Does someone in here need freedom? just to experience freedom? Do, do, do you need a friend who, who, who will never stop praying for you? A, a friend who will never criticize you? A friend who will never betray you? A friend who will never gossip behind your back? I know I'm talking to someone. Do, do, do you need to know that you are genuinely and eternally loved? Do you need to be on a mission that is so much bigger than you and gives you the greatest purpose and satisfaction? No one can meet the genuine needs of your heart, mind, body, and soul except Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can answer those questions. We need Jesus as our faithful and merciful high priest. Look, I, I... Our entire society and the structures of this world, they depend on on convincing you and I that we need something more than and other than Jesus Christ. Like, uh, they are designed that way to to keep you from from, from coming to Jesus, from believing Jesus. They're not just there to be like, you know, hey, I just want to be your friend. That's not what's happening. Designed to keep you from Jesus. When in reality, what we need is Jesus as our faithful and merciful high priest. But 
But here's the thing. Here's the thing. There is only one who can satisfy the needs of your soul. Like, I know you're sitting here going, Oni, you, you, you're saying the same thing. You're just saying it differently. Yes, that's intentional. Because for many of us, we'll go, no, I know this, Oni. And then go on and live your life. And do the things that, that, that keep you from Jesus. And so for many of us, we, we, need, we need to be confronted with this daily, regularly, from different angles. There is only one who can satisfy the needs of your soul. There, there is only one who, who meets perfectly every cry of your heart. Yeah, amen. And his name is Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. But, but how? How do we know Jesus can? It's a big statement, don't it? I mean, let's be honest. He's competing against a lot. There are a lot of things that, 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 that are crying for the attention of your heart and for your soul. And so how do you know that Jesus is better? How do you know that he is the one? How? What makes him better? How is he any different from any other religion? How is he different from any other really, really good self-help book? And there are many of those. There is a whole industry built on those. How is he better than a really close friend that I have? You know, chaw me. Like, how, how, do you, how do you know? <laughs> or even a great Bible teacher. How do you know? Well, I believe the answer is found in the descriptions that are given of Jesus in verses 26 to 28. And so if you were sitting here panicking, thinking, oh my goodness, are we going to walk through every single verse? <laughs> I've been coming to Rooted for a while, and that's on his, like, that's his style, like verse one, duh, 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 verse two, duh, 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 and, but that's what we do, all right? Because you need God's word as much, like, I know my words are, they're okay, right? They're okay, but Jesus' words are better, they're perfect, they're what you need. But, but for d- today, no, 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 we're just going to... Which is going to be in verses 26 to 28. And in those verses, we are given everything that we need to know that shows us that Jesus is better. Amen. And so let's unpack them. Right out the gates, we see that Jesus is better because Jesus, our high priest, is holy. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that alone, like we should go home on that one. Yeah. Jesus, our high priest, is holy. Holy, that's what makes him better. This means that there is no trace of evil in him other than that which we put on him. He is holy. He is uniquely God's holy one. He is set apart to God. He stands accepted before God, whereas we are inherently, and this is going to make some of you super uncomfortable, we are inherently from birth evil in our motives and our deeds. And I know some of you are going, like, you, like I look at a little baby. There's no ways. The Bible says so. Inherently. And if you're thinking that, then just spend a little bit more time with that baby. You'll find yourself asking questions. You're like, who taught you how to lie? Like, who taught you selfish? Inherently. Some of us struggle to believe that we are inherently born evil because we look at ourselves in the mirror a little bit too long. You know, it's like, I'm not that bad. It's like, who, who are you comparing yourself to? Yeah. Okay. Like, like the criminal who's in prison for the rest of his life. Yeah, sure. Hopefully you're not that bad. But, but, but the criminal is not the standard. The murderer is not the standard. You are not the standard. God, God stands and looks at creation and he says, I am the standard. I am the standard. And compared to him, we fail dismally. Each and every one of us. But Jesus stands holy. That's why he's better. 
He is holy. Second thing that we see here that makes Jesus better is that he is he's innocent. Not only is he holy, but he's, he's innocent. This means that, that he was without guilt. Now, it, it doesn't mean that he wasn't immune from being accused of sin and evil. No, that's not what it means. Because the Pharisees, they, I mean, they attempted to do that on several occasions. Yeah. But they had no grounds for doing so. Yeah. See, nothing could stick to Jesus. Yeah. Whether it was the law of God or the law of the land, he was without blame. Yeah. Whether his words or actions, inner motives or feelings, he always came out innocent. Whereas us, guilty on every charge. Yeah. On every charge. It's like we're standing in court and we're listening to the judge. At some point we go, judge, just stop. Just stop. Because he goes, liar, deceiver, adulterer. I've never slept with anyone. Uh, remember Jesus says, if you've looked, said, oh, yes, 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 carry on, judge. Murderer, I've never killed anyone. If you've ever harbored anger in your heart to your brothers, then you're a murderer. Judge, stop. Just, just we're guilty on every charge. And yet we're told that Jesus is innocent. Let's keep going. It's going to be a quick sermon today. We hope. <laughs> We're told that he was undefiled. Mm -hmm. This word has in view the ceremonial purity that was required of high priests during the time of the Old Testament. That's, that's what this word is it's connected to that. Like when you see that in the context of Hebrews 7 and in the context of the whole book of Hebrews, you must make the connection back to the Old Testament because he's talking about the high priests. Undefiled. Let, let me give you a, a, few, a few of the stains and flaws that would disqualify a man from serving in the tabernacle or temple. Like some things that would disqualify a high priest. Like if he had these things, it'd be like, hey, not this year. Unless you want to go in there and die. If you were with us uh, a couple of, couple of weeks ago in the book of uh, Hebrews, you would remember that the practice for the high priest was that they would, they would go into the temple, go into the tabernacle to make these sacrifices on behalf of the people so that they might be reconciled back to God. They might have a relationship with him. But if you had some sin in your life, if you had not done what you were supposed to do, and when you walked in, they would have a rope tied to your legs so that if you drop dead, then they'd be able to pull you out. And so the high priest was examined. Before going in, you were examined. Before you met with God, you were examined. And here are some of the things that would disqualify you from going in. If you had made contact with a dead body, you're out. If you have a bald patch on your head, Some of you are already out now. It's... <laughs> I didn't read uh, anything about a receding hairline, so <laughs> still in the game. <laughs> if he shaved off the edges of his beard, you're out. If you had any self-inflicted cuts on your body, you're out. If he was blind or lame or had an arm or leg that was longer than the other, you're out. If you had an injured foot or hand, you're out. Friends, this would, like, this would have been an HR nightmare, <laughs> right? Like an absolute HR nightmare. It's front page news. Can you believe discrimination? <laughs> but that was the law. And if you don't believe me, you can go read Leviticus 21 for yourself. Good luck. <laughs> See, th these requirements, of course, in no way suggest that, that such an affliction today would disqualify you from being in the presence of God. But, but here's the point. Here's the point. God, God was saying, to be in my presence, 
it's, it's a big deal. And I don't want you guys treating it like some, oh yeah, you know, I'm just going quickly to Willie's to go buy milk. It's a big deal to be in the presence of God. That's, that's the point here. And, and he's just going, I, just, I want my people to know that. That to, to access the presence of God requires utter and absolute, hear this, perfection. To, to access the presence of God requires utter and absolute perfection. We are in trouble. If that is the case, then let's just pack this up and go. However, in the case of Jesus, he was morally and spiritually undefiled, which means he had no moral failures. He had no spiritual failures. How is that possible? Or how is that possible in a, in a world with so many temptations? How is it possible that, that, that Jesus had, had, had no failures? How? If you were to answer, because he never sinned, you'd be correct. And, and if you wanted bonus points, if you said he never sinned because... He was God, he is God, then you would be correct. Jesus was and is and will forever be fully God. And God by definition cannot sin. God by definition cannot sin. And so when he says I will never lie, he means it. When he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he means it. When he says, I will be there for you, he means it. Yeah. By definition, God cannot lie. Yeah. A- and Jesus was and is and will forever be fully God. Yeah. But Jesus was also and still is fully man. Yeah. We-, we cover this in the earlier parts of our sermon series in the book of Hebrews. Jesus is both fully God, and then when he he moved into the neighborhood, when he he came into creation, when he became a man, he became fully man. I want you to think about that for a moment. He's always been fully God, and then decides to take on human flesh and become fully man. I'm going to be real with you, I would never do that. Aren't you glad that I am not your savior? But here's the reality. I I know many of you, in fact, I'd go as far as to say, none of y'all would do that. It's easy to say, to be like, I've created all of this, all of this from my hand. I hold it all together. And you know what? I'm going to step into it and live among them and feel what they feel and go through persecution from them. The, like, think about it for a moment. Like, like, for someone who you created to now slap you in the face, you're like, hold, hold up, God, I know we were on this way, we were going in this direction, but God, let, if this cup passed for me, let me, do you know, like, I, I'm just being honest, I would. And yet, Jesus doesn't. This points to his humility. His humility, but also his sacrificial love. Fully God, fully man. But but let me say this. I believe Jesus remained holy, innocent, and undefiled. Yes, because he's fully God and and, and all of that to be true. But I, I also believe because he consistently relied upon the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. I believe that Jesus remained holy, innocent, and undefiled because he consistently relied upon the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Look, he faced trials and temptations. He he felt the full impact of Satan's seductive allures. Like, he, he, he got them all. He wasn't immune to any of these. But the difference is, he never yielded to them. He never yielded to them, but rather yielded to the Spirit. Why do you think Jesus would often break away and go be with the Father? 
I, I believe it's because he was feeling the weight in his humanity. He was feeling the weight of this world. And he's like, I just need to be with my dad. I need to be with my father. I, I get it. I get, I get what you guys are going through. And you know what? There's an answer to that temptation. It's God. It's to lean into the presence. It's to lean into the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But you see, so many of us, what we do is we just give in. We just give in, and then our lives spiral out of control, and we're like, how did I get you? I'd like to tell you. You took your eyes off Jesus. And yet Jesus was like, my eyes are always on the Father. Always on the Father. I mean, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, where, like, where the pressure was on, the heat was on, he can, he can see the cross. And he, he cries out to the, like, if there's another way, but not my will, your will be done. I'm going to lean into the presence and the power. And you know, the same Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit now lives in you. For those who've crossed the line of faith, the same Holy Spirit now lives in you. The same Holy Spirit empowers you. And so the question is, will you surrender to him? Or will you surrender to sin? That's that's the choice that we have every day. Am I going to surrender to the Holy Spirit, to the work of the Holy Spirit in my life, or am I going to surrender to sin? Let's just be honest. That's, that's the choice on the table. A- am I going to choose to look to, look to Jesus or, or, or am I going to choose to look to what is on the internet? A- am I going to choose to follow Christ even in this toxic environment or am I going to choose to go, you know what, yeah, I'm going to get what's mine? Am I going to choose to trust Jesus for provision or, or am I going to steal a little bit? Are you going to surrender to the Spirit or are you going to surrender to sin? He was undefiled. Let's keep going. Jesus as high priest, the writer of Hebrews tells us, is separated from sinners. This is why he's better. Separated from sinners. Not in the sense of refusing to fellowship with us. Not in the sense that he regards us as beneath his dignity. No, 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 no. Not in the sense that he won't draw near to us and love us and always be present with us. That's not what he means. Rather, he is separated in that he has never and never will commit the sins that we commit. I hope you're seeing that these are all connected. I've just broken them up in part, but if you were to read them in the original language, they're all connected. I like how the New Living Translation puts it. It says, he has been set apart from sinners. He is set apart to God, therefore he stands accepted before God. I'll give that to you again. He he is set apart to God, therefore he stands accepted before God. That's why Jesus, we're then told, is exalted above the heavens. That is why he is exalted above the heavens. He he holds all things together. I I love, absolutely love, and you've you've heard me read this a few times, and if you're going to be here for a while, you're going to continue to hear me quote this passage. I absolutely love it, Colossians chapter 1. Anytime I go, man, who is this Jesus? I go to Colossians chapter 1. I'll just read to you two verses, but the whole chapter is incredible. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything and in the heavenly realms and on earth, he made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He is exalted above the heavens. And so you can pick which one you want. Both of them are true. He's exalted above the heavens because I'm I'm different to you. I don't sin like you do. He's exalted above the heavens because, oh, and I created everything. In fact, I hold it together. The very fact that your heart is beating right now is because Jesus commands it to do so.
And so if all of this is true, if all of this is true, that he is holy, that he is innocent, that he is undefiled, separate from sinners, exalted above the heavens, then, verse 27, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do. First, for their own sins, then for those of the people. He did this once for all time when he offered himself. We're told here that Jesus dealt with sin once and for all when he once and for all offered up himself. He he is different from any high priest that has ever lived. As, As reassuring and helpful as the old covenant sacrificial system was, and it was, It was. Generation after generation after generation, they held on to that sacrificial system. Why? Because we want to be in fellowship with God. So we will do whatever it takes. We will do whatever he says so that we might be in fellowship with him. And so so as, as reassuring and as helpful as that sacrificial system was, it still had inherent flaws and deficiencies. And one of them being what we've just been told, that the high priest had to first make a sacrifice for himself before making a sacrifice on behalf of everyone else. Why did he have to do that? Because he himself was sinful. He himself imperfect. But Jesus approaches God and offers himself. He, he's, not, he's not looking at the animals and checking and going, okay, listen. He's, he's not like, oh, you know, am I, am I the right height? Is everything? No, 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 no. He just shows up and offers himself. The sacrifice was his own life. But also, hear this, but also his intimacy and fellowship with the Father. He sacrificed that. He gave it up and, and, and suffered separation under divine judgment so that we might never have to suffer such horror. Yeah. He, he did not make an offering for himself, but of himself. The language matters. Not for himself, which every single high priest had to do, but of himself. And he did this, we're told, once for all time. Once for all time. There there is no need for another. No, No second or third or annual sacrifice for sin is needed. We don't have to atone with a sacrifice for every sin we commit. It's been done once and for all time by Jesus. That's what we're being told. How is he better? That's how he's better. We we mentioned this in our very first sermon in the sermon series as we jumped into the book of Hebrews. When we saw that Jesus, after making purification for sin, some of y'all remember that? He did what? He He sat down at the right hand of the Father. The high priest sat, showing the conclusion of his work. See, up until then, high priests never sat during the ceremonial cleansing. There was no sitting, none, zero, nothing. But here we're told that Jesus sat. Jesus, after making purification for sin, sat at the right hand of the Father. No no high priest had ever done that. I don't know the full total of all the high priests that have ever served. I don't. I know Aaron was the OG. There's a few after. What we do know is that when when Solomon built the first temple, there were 16. And then when the second temple was built, there were 60, right? So that's about 78. But, But we know there's more, okay? We don't know the full total, but there were a lot of high priests before Jesus. None of them sat. And so when they, when they witnessed 
when they saw Jesus sitting down, I believe, look, it's not, it's, it's not in the scripture, so I'm, I'm, I'm putting it in there, okay? This is what I think. This is what I, okay, no, I'm not putting it in there. Woo! That's how you empty a church quick. Um, I'm not putting it in there. This is my own imagination. I believe when Jesus sat, I really do, I think when he sat, all of heaven went quiet. Absolute confusion. A high priest never sits. What is this saying? But no one says anything, right? Because we're, we're all watching, like, all of heaven going, he just, he just sat. A- and then I think Aaron, because Aaron's the OG, right? I-, I think Aaron looks and goes, I know what's going on. A- and then he starts it. Don't leave me hanging. And, and, all, and all of heaven erupts because in that moment they realize, they recognize, oh my goodness, it's done. It's done. The things that we've been doing over and over and over and over again, hoping to get to God, it's done. We don't have to do that anymore. All we have to do is fix our eyes on Jesus after making purification for sins. He sat. If you're still trying to figure out why Jesus is better, that's why. That's why we need him as our faithful and merciful high priest. That is why the writer of Hebrews ends the chapter by saying, for the law appoints as high priests men who are weak. Weak. And don't just think the high priests think us weak. I know today, that'll get you canceled. How dare you say I'm weak? You're weak, you're weak. In comparison to God, you are weak. You cannot do what Jesus has done. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the promise of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been perfected forever. See, the role of the high priest, the role of the high priest was an exalted and honorable office. Just no small thing. No small thing. But those who were appointed were still sinful men, appointed by the law. The law of who? The law of Moses. Who upon their death, their role would come to an end, and there would be need of another one. But not Jesus. Jesus. Oh, but not Jesus. God appointed his son to be the high priest and sealed it by an oath. Sealed it by an oath. And that oath is pointing us to Psalm 110, verse 4, the other place that we hear about Melchizedek. I'm going to read that to you. And as I do, I'm going to ask the band to come up and close us out. Psalm 110, verse 4. It says, The Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. My, my hope is that, like, I'm going to read the rest of it, okay? But my hope is that, like, you, you, you read that and you go, what are the promises has God made? What, what, what are the promises has God made? And, and, and if you are a Christian, if you've crossed the line of faith, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want you to know that every single promise, every single promise is yes and amen for you. You, you don't work for the promises. You work from them. They are yours. And so the question is, will you believe? But first, you must believe that God, who makes the promises, will never take them back. So I don't know what you're hoping for. I don't know what you're trusting God for. But if he's made a promise, hear me, he will never take it. 
you can bank on it. The Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. You are a priest forever, according to the pattern of Melchizedek. See, Jesus' priestly office and ministry lasts forever. Amen. Trying to figure out what Hebrews 7 is about? There it is. Jesus' priestly office and ministry lasts forever. He, he, he will... He will never be replaced by another. There is no need. His ministry on your behalf doesn't last for a year or a century or a millennium. No, 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 no. It is everlasting and eternal. He cannot be upgraded. He cannot be upgraded. Friends, your phone has room for improvement. Your car has room for improvement. Your house, I've been to some of yours, has room for improvement. You have room for improvement. But Jesus, he is perfect forever. is why he's better that is why your soul your soul desperately needs Jesus as our faithful and merciful high priest <laughs> now, now don't get me wrong don't get me wrong let me say this and I'll be out your way don't get me wrong Jesus endured a lifetime of testing and hardship and temptation and in every instance proved faithful whenever obedience was called for he obeyed whenever the right word was needed he spoke it whenever the righteous act was the required one he performed it as he progressed through life on earth he moved from untested obedience to tested and proven obedience and he did that every single time And he did so to show us that he is qualified. He is qualified and capable of filling the role of our great high priest. And so because of that, we can believe in verse 25, which says, therefore, therefore, he is able to save completely. He is able to save completely. Permit me to give this word completely, this English word completely, some breath. He is able to save absolutely. He is able to save thoroughly. He is able to save totally, comprehensively, effectively, entirely, utterly, wholly, unconditionally, unreservedly. Can I keep going? He is able to save outright. He is able to save in all respects. He is able to save in every respect. He is able to save in every way. He is able to save in full. I got a few more. He is able to save inside out. He is able to save to the core. He is able to save to the end. He is able to save to the max. He is able to save perfectly. Those who come to God through him. And so the question this morning is, will you come to God? Will you come to God? Another way to say it is, is, is will you go, you know what, I am actually not in control of my life. Like, I, I think I am, but I'm not. I am in desperate need of a savior. And this morning I heard his name is Jesus, our faithful and merciful high priest. And all I have to do is look to the heavens and go, I need a savior. God, save me. You know what, I know there are tons of prayer requests in this room. 
And I will come alongside you and pray every single one with expectation. But I don't know. I don't know if he's going to do it the way that you want him to do it. I don't even know if he's going to do it. Maybe he has something better for you. But you know what? There is a prayer request that I know that he answers every single time. God, save me. And because he is the faithful and merciful high priest, he is able to save completely. And so the question, will will you? You're sitting here and you're like, you know what, I've been doing this church thing for a while. Guys, we live in a context where, like, are you a Christian? Yes. Why? Uh, Because one time I went to like a church with my parents. That, That will not give you access to the Father. Great things to do, to gather, to sing together, to pr- in- beautiful things to do. But the only thing, the only thing that will put you in the presence of God the Father is Jesus Christ. It's surrendering your life to Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who sat down. He sat down. since he always lives to intercede for them. He's able to save those who cry out, save me. And this saving is not not just for salvation. It's not just for that first time when you cross the line of faith, when you surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, that that, that saving is, is, is through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And so there's a message for you, for you who have crossed the line of faith, for you, Christian, who I've been walking with Jesus for a while, so maybe this isn't for me. No, it's for you as well. For you to cry out to him and say, my life is not the way it should be. I have wandered from prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. And so even in that wondering, you can cry out to him and say, save me. Why? Because he's praying for you. He's interceding for you. Because his he's office, his priestly office is forever. He's still praying for you, working for you on your behalf. He's still there for you. And so will you lean in? Will you trust? Will, will you go, you know what? I, I actually, you know what? I, this is, here's what I've been doing. And God, I know that it doesn't honor you. It doesn't please you. It doesn't glorify you. It's another slap to your face. but I don't have to remain here. We say here at Rooted Fellowship, we want this to be a safe space where where it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay not okay. What we're saying is you are more than welcome. But but man, there, there is so much more for you. There is so much more for you. He is able to save completely. And so, Father God, I pray. I pray now in this moment for every single person in this room. I pray for every single heart. God, would you meet them where they are? Maybe invited by a friend. Maybe quickly Googled online this morning, nearest church to me. I, you know, God, you know how people showed up here. Maybe a a regular. Haven't quite committed, haven't quite really connected. Maybe a member. Been part of this community for years now. God, would you meet all of us where we are? And would you soften our hearts yet again? Many of us, we've, we've, we've hardened our hearts because of, because of experiences, because of, because of things that have happened to us, even by those who are part of the church. God, I pray that you would find those soft areas and that you would make your way in and through and that you would bring healing and restoration, that there would be a reconciling work happening right now in this very moment. pray that you would fan the flame. I pray for those who don't know you as Lord and Savior, 
Would you move them from orphan to child? Would you move them from darkness to light? Would they now have a seat at your table because of the finished work of Jesus Christ? And would they recognize that all they have to do is say, God, save me. I accept the full life and work of Jesus Christ. And then would we as a community come around them and then help them figure out what it means to follow you? I pray for your hurting children this morning. Maybe they feel abandoned. They feel lonely. They feel isolated. They feel like they can't share things with others. God, I pray for freedom in Jesus' name. And then I pray for all of us as a community. I pray that as we stand now and as we sing to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, that it would be more than just words on a screen, but that we'd be able to to look back at our lives and see, God, your fingerprints of grace scattered all over our lives. Jesus, even now to think, in this very moment, you are sitting at the right hand of the Father. It's all done, all finished. cried out, it is finished. You demonstrating it by sitting down. For all to see. Your body broken, your blood shed so that we might be reconciled back to our loving Father. Help us. It's in your beautiful name we pray.